Good morning. Good morning. It is the first Sunday of Lent, the season. <laughs> All right, let me try that again. Good morning. It's the first Sunday of Lent, the season of preparation, where we are reminded of the incredible love that God has for us, a love that was so powerful that God was willing to subject God's self to, to being incarnate as a human being, to living the lives that we live, lives of, of pain and want, of, of fear sometimes, but also of great joy and tremendous love. God was willing to become incarnate. God was willing to live this life. God was willing to suffer, to show us what it means to sacrifice for one another, what true love, how it's really embodied. Um, And then ultimately, God chose to die for us, and God chose to rise for us, to remind us that even death has no power over the love of God. In these next several weeks, we prepare ourselves. We are, uh, we repent of, of our wayward ways. We realign ourselves with God. Um, and we trust that throughout all of it, the Holy Spirit is going to be there to help us, uh, to guide us into that relationship. God's relationship with us is always steadfast, but sometimes our relationship with God wanders. And so today is the first Sunday of Lent And uh, I hope that you will join me in this journey together as we prepare. Um, But I was, this morning, uh, I I got to my first service in North Adams, and I was getting everything set up, and and I don't know, I don't know what happened, but every single piece of technology that I need failed this morning. I essentially had to rebuild the entire thing from scratch. So I'm working on, I'm getting everything assembled, I'm getting everything put together, and I realized that I didn't bring my iPad. Um, which is fairly central to how I preach, how I lead worship. I was, uh, but the very first, I was reminded of the very first time I ever led worship in a church. It was the United Methodist Church of Woburn, Massachusetts. And I'm guessing you probably haven't. The uh, sanctuary is on the upper level, right? So it's always kind of warm up there. Um, and then the chancel is about as high as this one. So you're a little bit higher and it's even warmer. And the first time I led worship, I want to say, was like a July day. And there's no air conditioning, and there were like no ceiling fans, and I sweat. And it was uncomfortable, and, but they knew that, so they thought they would bless me by putting all these fans up. So there were fans all over the place, right? Um, and they were all, there were like 30 fans, and they were all aimed right at the pulpit. It was like that old Memorex commercial. I'm like, I gotta get to the pulpit! So I get up to the pulpit to preach, and I'm about to deliver my first sermon, and the first time I'm leading worship, and I have my sermon uh, on, the, on the, the sheets of paper in front of me, and I, and I went and I set them down on the pulpit, and I kind of took a step back to center myself, and all the pages blowing across the chancel. And I immediately uh, left church that day, went to a Best Buy, bought an iPad, and have never looked back. And I've got colleagues who are like, what if your battery dies? I'm like, well, I don't know, those batteries last a pretty long time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're not going to die. Um, and I'd say to him, like, what if your pages get blown all over the chancel? He's like, well, I don't know. I number my pages. I can pick them up and put them back in order. And so we had this back and forth about which was the more uh, logical way to function. Uh, and then in the end, we agreed to disagree. Um, and we agreed that each of us has our way of doing it, and each way is valid. But more importantly, what we agreed out is it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you know, I lead from an iPad or he leads from a piece of paper. It doesn't matter whether my battery dies or his papers get blown all over the place because this isn't my church, right? My words aren't the words that you need to hear and take into your heart and live your life through. This is God's church, and there is nothing that we can do to mess it up. There is nothing that we can do to make it not a holy gathering. There is nothing that we can do that is going to stop us from living into this communion that we have with each other and with God. I can't break it, and you can't break it, because they did everything they could to break Jesus, and he still walked out of that tomb. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good 
this week. Um, am I on? Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes? I know, it just doesn't sound right, but that's okay. Um, we will note that uh, this week we will have our uh, six-week Lenten study is going to start on Wednesday afternoon at 1.30. There are still our books available. This may be a last-minute thing for people, but if there's anybody else interested, see me after worship because there still are some books left. And we will meet here in Jane's room at 1.30 on Wednesday. On Thursday morning, we will continue, pick up, have our <laughs> resume, our Bible study with Pastor Steve. And next Sunday, after following worship, the ladies, um, the people that have been reading the book Phoebe, we will ask you to bring your lunch, and we will meet here after church up in Jane's room. We'll have lunch, and then we'll discuss the book that was read. Make note, a food pantry can always use all kinds of things, but for February, we're looking for the things that are listed in your bulletin, so please keep that in mind. And I don't think there's any meetings this week. Are there any other announcements from anybody? Pam Wall. Thank you, Pam. Okay, well, let us be in the spirit of worship.
go down. Come on down. Come on, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. That sounded good. I don't, I don't even need a woohoo for that one. That was just, that was delicious. So now I have our call to worship. God of our solitude, we worship you. Christ, our companion, we look to you. Holy Spirit, our hope, help us worship, help us love, help us live. Let us pray together. Gentle God, Jesus went into the wilderness to face his shadow side. Accompany us into the darkness of our own souls. Come and heal us, shed some light, and lead us to the wholeness of life. Amen. Let us now... Wade in the water together. Sometimes we do have to be called back to the water. Sometimes I know, I know there, there are uh, there are 
uh, denominations out there that say that once you've been saved, you're, you're saved and it's all, you know, glory and trumpets going forward. But we're, we're Methodists and we understand that we're still made of the stuff of humanity. And sometimes we backslide. Um, sometimes we step back into the ways that God is calling us out of. But we know that every time we do, we can. We can go back to that water. We can revisit the waters of our baptism that incorporated us into the family of God. We can reach out for God. And we know that God's provenient grace, God's grace that surrounds us, even before we even know we need it, is always there. Inviting us back into the relationship that we forsake, but God never does. So we know that we can bring our confessions to God, knowing that God hears us, and that God has already forgiven us out of God's unrelenting love. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that our love is wounded. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. But your love is perfect. And so we open ourselves to your love to receive your forgiveness and to be transformed by your grace so that our repentance may be love overflowing to you, to all people, and to the ends of creation. Amen. Let's take a few moments for those prayers we keep silently in our hearts. We have this God, we have this incredible God who loves us despite everything. We have this incredible Savior who continues to save us over and over again. And we have the Holy Spirit, God's indwelling presence, that calls us into the way that leads to righteousness. All of these things are God's gifts to us, given out of God's amazing grace, that always hears us, always sees us, and always forgives us, no matter what. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven, and you are forgiven, and you are forgiven. Y'all are forgiven. Even I am forgiven. Amen? Amen. 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 And now I'm going to invite Cherry to come up and read some scripture for us. The first reading is Psalm 2. Why do the nations rant? Why do the peoples rave uselessly? The earth's rulers take their stand. The leaders scheme together against the Lord and against this, his anointed one. Come, they say, we will tear off their ropes and throw off their chains. The one who rules in heaven laughs. My Lord makes fun of them. But then God speaks to them angrily. Then he terrifies them with his fury. I hereby anoint my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will announce the Lord's decision. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Just ask me and I will make the nations your possession. The far corners of the earth will be your property. You will smash them with an iron rod. You will shatter them like a pottery jar. So kings, wise up. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord reverently, trembling, kiss his feet, or else he will become angry, and your way will be destroyed, because his anger ignites in an instant. But all who take refuge in the Lord are truly happy. The second reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, And John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open and the spirit, like a dove, coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, 
You are my son, who I dearly love. In you I find happiness. At once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust his good news. So I want to share with you uh, my first experience driving a car. My very first driving experience. Uh, I, I think the, the car was a 1983 or a 1984 Renault Encore 5-speed. Huh? So um, it was a two-door hatchback with a sunroof. And for some reason, my stepfather, what well, my brother and I decided, my stepfather thought this was kind of a low-speed sports car. I can still recall uh, seeing him. Every time he sat down to drive that car, I can see him putting on his brown leather driving gloves to drive that. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, can you, have you ever seen anything as electrifying as that? 
I mean, doesn't that just get your blood going, huh? <laughs> anyway, like I said, this was my first driving experience. I was uh, 15 and a half, which is in Pennsylvania at the time, you could get your learner's permit at halfway before your 16th birthday, but you had to wait until you were 16 to get your driver's license. So on the day, on the day I could get it, on June 4th of 1987, I went and I... I, I I'm sorry, what? <laughs> on, June f on June 4th of 1987, I went and I got my learner's permit. And I, uh, but I didn't, I didn't go driving that day. I think we had to wait till the next Saturday because my stepfather was going to teach me how to drive and, and he was working. But on that next Saturday, Paul, my stepfather Paul and I, we went out to an abandoned shopping mall with a huge parking lot and we spent some time with me just kind of driving around. He taught me how to work the clutch. He taught me how to uh, shift and when, to, and he, just, he taught me how to drive. I remember two things about that Renault Encore. Uh, the first is that it had what my stepdad called an iffy clutch, right? So that meant sometimes you'd, you'd push the clutch in and, and the, mo the motor would, or the transmission would disengage the way it was supposed to, and then sometimes you'd push the clutch in and something else would happen. And it wasn't always the same thing. The other thing I remember is that there was something wrong with the gear shift stick, with the stick. Right? Um, there was something not quite right about it. Right? So you'd be, uh, go, you'd be in first, you'd go to second, you'd go to third, but if you wanted to go to fourth, you had to really want it. Right? There was something bent in there or something, and if you wanted to go to fourth gear, you, had to, you couldn't just pull it out, you had to like pull! Like you had to force it in to fourth gear, which is something that would have been nice if they told me before I had my first driving lesson. You see some foreshadowing happening here? Uh, if you didn't pull hard, it would shift effortlessly back into second gear. So we drove around the parking lot for a while, and finally he said, okay, let's head home. And I said, all right, that was a lot of fun. I can't wait to do it again. And so I went to pull into a park. It's an abandoned parking lot, but I'm like, I got to park between the white lines in my parking spot. I pull into the parking spot. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, we're going to drive home now. You're going to take the wheel. He's like, no, you're going to drive home. I said, who in the what now? Hmm? I'd never been behind the wheel of a car to that point in my life, and all I did was spend an hour driving around an abandoned parking lot, never getting out of second gear. And he wants me to go drive on the roads in Pittsburgh, which is all hills with a manual transmission, never having done it before. Yep, you're driving. I said, uh, how about next time I'll drive? <laughs> this time, this was a good day. Let's just call it over. And he gives me this look, and he says, go to the exit now, or you'll never drive again. Tough love. So I went to the exit, and I turned onto the street, and to my credit, I didn't stall, drove fine, stayed on my side of the road. Now, to this point, I'd never gotten out of second gear but out on the roads, I had to go into third gear, but that happened fine, and I'm starting to groove, right? And I'm like, I kind of like this driving thing, all right? I'm doing fine. Get on the highway. What? <laughs> I'm like, okay, now, I, I, I'll drive home, like, but we can do this without the highway. He's like, get on the highway now. So, look, this is a bad idea, right? I'm not comfortable with this. I'm starting to feel some anxiety. Get on the highway now. He forced me to get on the highway. So I got on the highway. The roads were empty. It's a Saturday afternoon. There's nothing going on. It's a pretty straight shot. The lanes are wide. I'm kind of grooving. I get into third gear. But then I had to shift into fourth. And they still hadn't told me <laughs> that that wasn't smooth in this car. So I put the clutch down, and I dropped the lever cleanly back into second gear at 45 miles an hour. Whee! Right, like the car instantly redlines. The car is screaming. Paul is shouting at me. And then suddenly on this deserted highway, this tractor trailer goes, like right down next to me. And I'm like, ah, 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 ah. And I panicked, and I lost control. And on one side of the highway, there was a, a hill, and on the other side, there was a, a guardrail. But I go, I lost control. I went up, I went up the hill, like, at, 
an angle like this. And the car starts to stall, and like the engine's popping, and like we're slowing down, and I can feel like, you ever, have you ever been so far up a hill that you kind of feel like the weight's coming off the upper wheels, right? I can start to feel that doing, so I like jam on the gas again. The car digs in, and I shoot back onto the highway. and somehow managed to come to a stop in the breakdown lane. And I'm like, <laughs> but no one was hurt. We all came away unscathed, except my pride and that poor little Renault Encore, whose frame went from this to that. <laughs> and, uh, and so we had to sit there and we had to wait for a tow truck. My first driving experience. For years at family gatherings, my stepfather Paul would tell that story, not caring or not realizing how angry it made me. Because he was telling the story to get a laugh. But I'm like, I didn't want to go on the highway. You forced me to go on the highway. I argued against it because I was afraid I would get into an accident. You forced me to do it. And sure enough, I got into an accident. It wasn't my fault. But he literally threatened that if I didn't do it, I would never drive again. He forced me to do it. So today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Now, the Gospel of Mark was the first, the earliest written of the Gospels. It's the most stripped down. There's, uh, there's fewer words in the Gospel of Mark. And the words that do exist in the Gospel of Mark, a lot of them are apocalyptic. A lot of them are doom and gloom. There's not a lot of flowery language in this Gospel. It's very stripped down. For example, the, uh, the baptism of Jesus here gets, what, three verses? Jesus came to the Jordan. John baptized him. The heavens opened up, God said, yo, right? That's like the whole baptism in this. There's none of this, you come to me and yet I ought to be baptized by you. There's none of that. It's just Jesus came, Jesus got dunked, the heavens opened up, that was it. The, the temptation is like two sentences in Mark. Mark is very stripped down. The other thing about Mark is it can be pretty aggressive. Like if you really pay attention to Mark, the stories in Mark aren't the ones that you think about when you think about these stories. So let me tell you this story again. Let me, let me tell you this story one more time. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth, of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. While he was coming out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open and the Spirit like a dove coming down on him. Right, so... Uh, Jesus saw the heavens splitting open. In Matthew, it says, the heavens opened. The heavens opened. You know, rays of sunshine. And The Common English Bible has Mark saying, the heavens splitting open, which is suggestive. But the Greek word is schizo. Like, schizo is the Greek word. And literally, that means to be forcefully or violently divided into parts, pieces, or factions. The same word, schizo, is used later in Jesus' ministry when it says, and again, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, then he died. Look, the curtain of the sanctuary was schizoed. It was torn in two. It was violently ripped asunder. The earth shook, the rock split, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised. Schizo is not, you know, oh, the heavens peacefully opening up. Schizo is violent. Schizo is dangerous. And the spirit, like a dove, descended on him. Doesn't that sound like a pretty picture? You know, a nice white dove floating down from heaven. We see this all the time, right? The same rays of sunshine that we think come out of the heavens when it gently opens up or behind the dove and it's carrying an olive branch in its mouth. And oh, that's a really pretty sign. Except that this isn't that kind of dove, right? This is a rock dove. You know what we call a rock dove? A pigeon. This is a pigeon, right? There's a pigeon coming down from heaven to Jesus. So, um, the heavens are violently ripped open and the pigeon of God flew down and dive-bombed Jesus. And then what happened? Well, at once the Spirit forced Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. Doesn't that sound idyllic, right? Doesn't that sound wonderful? All the while, of course, uh, we have... There was the voice from heaven, you are my son whom I dearly love, and in you I find happiness. And I'm like, right now, in the midst of that story, of that description, that sounds kind of iffy to me. 
But I got stuck on the forced thing, the forced into the wilderness. The heavens were ripped open. The pigeon of the Lord flapped down around Jesus' head and kept kind of flapping around him like, you know, an Alfred Hitchcock movie and drove him out into the wilderness. It forced him into the wilderness. I could almost hear God saying, get into the wilderness now. And I'm like, I feel you, Jesus. Get on the highway now. And I wonder, how badly did Jesus not want to go into that wilderness? How badly did Jesus not want to go experience hunger and thirst and temptation and torment? He clearly didn't want to go, or he wouldn't have had to be forced into the wilderness. And that makes this kind of a hard passage for me to read because I don't believe that God sends earthquakes or disasters or diseases or evil or hardship. I don't believe that God forces us into anything. I don't believe that God tests us into anything. I don't believe that God makes us do anything that we do not choose to do. But the Spirit forced Jesus into the wilderness. It violently ruptured heaven and swooped down like a giant bird of prey and forced him into the wilderness. And I'm like, so what gives? I mean, could God kind of get away with this because it was Jesus and not just a normal person? I mean, I don't want to think about God like that. But I wonder if it wasn't something else. I mean, at some point, I was going to have to get on the highway, right? You can't drive a car if you're not willing to go on the highway. I was going to have to do it. And so Paul recognized that I'd done really well and I had a really good day and I was doing well and he decided to kind of force my hand maybe to, to kind of get over it, to make it so that the next time I'd be willing to get on the highway without even thinking. He's ride the high that we're on and let's get on the highway. In other words, even though I didn't want to do it, Paul knew that I would have to do it, that I would want to do it. And maybe at some level, I already wanted to do it. But I was afraid. I wonder if that's what the Spirit saw in Jesus as he came up out of the water. I wonder if the Spirit saw that Jesus didn't want to go into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tormented, but the Spirit also knew that he was going to do it, that he needed to do it, that he would do it. But maybe he saw that Jesus was just afraid to start. Hey, you know you're going to do it eventually, so let's just get it done together. I wonder if the Spirit does that for us too, right? Sometimes it encourages us to do what we know that we're supposed to do, that we're ultimately, what we're ultimately going to do. But maybe what we might have a hard time getting started, because, I don't know, because sometimes we're lazy or sometimes we're daunted, sometimes we're afraid to get it going. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. I already reread that part, but I left this next part off. He was among the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. I wonder sometimes the Spirit also opens us up to whatever it is we're afraid of, whatever it is we're encountering, reminds us that we're not alone, and demonstrates to us that there is comfort and maybe even blessing in whatever it is that we're reluctant to do a story I heard a long time ago. There was a, a young man who was a member of some sort of group, a youth group or you know, Boy Scouts or something. He was a, a young man who was a member of some group, and all of the young men in that group had to do community service. And so this young man and his friend decided that they would visit people in the hospital. Now, they were, you know, they were young, and they didn't have any training or anything, and, and the, the hospital uh, people, the staff was delighted to have them do it, but they didn't send them into, you know, to people who were seriously ill. They sent them to people who had you know, broken legs or people who were recovering from a surgery or in this in one case it was a man who'd been hospitalized for a few weeks um, out of abundance of caution but it was recovering well from pneumonia. And so um, this young man had uh, visited him a few times over that th- three week or so stay um, and the guy was making progress but he was still there it was just out of an abundance of caution. And then he was, he was supposed to be discharged from the hospital, and so this young man decided he would go and be with him as he was being discharged from the hospital. But when he showed up at the hospital, uh, there was uh, something going on in the hallway. Like the, uh, the uh, 
like an, an ended f fury, uh, uh, frenzy rather. Um, like, you know when you, when you drive by an accident scene on the side of the road and there's just debris and one police car left, but all the other cars have been towed, the ambulances are gone, and there's this sense of the calm after the storm. That's what this young man encountered when he got there, right outside this man's room. And he went to a nurse and he said, hey, what's going on? And she, I don't remember what the kid's name was. I'll just call him Todd, right? She said, are you Todd? And he said, yes. Um, and she kind of looked at him sadly. And I don't remember the man's name either. I'll just call him Mr. Shepherd. Uh, so he said, are you, uh, are you Todd? Um, and she, the nurse said, he said, yes. And the nurse said, well, Mr. Shepherd has been asking for you. And he's like, all right, I'll go visit him. That's great. And she said, no, 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 we need to talk first. You need to understand. Uh, Shepherd has died. And he wanted to see you before he died. And Todd had no interest in that. He had no idea how to face it. He was afraid to go into that room. And so the, the nurse took him aside and talked to him and comforted him and, and kind of told him, just be there for him. Just listen to him. Just be present in the room. And eventually he said he'd go and she led him into the room. She didn't force him into the room, but she did encourage him to do what she knew he felt he needed to do and what she knew he would regret later if he didn't do it. And in the end, it was worth it because Todd sat down with Shepherd and he gave him comfort and he in turn received the blessing of wisdom and companionship and the joy of love shared in community. Was the nurse guided by the Spirit to encourage Todd to go visit Shepherd? Probably. Was Todd encouraged by the Spirit to accept both the burden of the visit and the blessing of talking to Shepherd before he passed away? I think so. I think he was. When Jesus came up out of the water, maybe in that one moment as the water was clearing from his eyes, before things you know, went differently and the heavens were ruptured open and the pigeon came down, in that one moment Jesus heard the voice of God saying, This is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit took action and did its thing. The Spirit guided, you know, kind of forcefully, but it still guided Jesus' next steps. But I wonder if those words echoed in Jesus' heart the entire time he was in the wilderness. This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. I wonder how much knowing that he was the Beloved of God might have helped him get through the wilderness. I wonder how much knowing that he was the Beloved of God let him accept the Spirit's guidance to push him into the wilderness in the first place. But that's the thing. God doesn't do things or force us to do things against our will. God doesn't throw bad things at us, and God doesn't test us. God loves us. God loves us. God loves us. We are so beloved of God that God does send the Spirit to remind us who we are. God sends the Spirit to show us what we're supposed to do in the world. And God sends the Spirit to guide us into doing it. Sometimes gently, sometimes with a little bit more force. But the Spirit always acts as the agent of God, reminding us that we, like Jesus, are beloved of God. That we, like Jesus, please God just as we are. And the Spirit helps us to respond to the needs of others by sharing that same love that we receive, that same compassion that we've been given. So there's one more part to the story of that ill-fated Renault Encore. <clears throat> we were waiting for a tow truck on the side of the road, and a state police officer pulled up to see if we were okay. When he realized there was an accident, he was legally bound to file an accident report. Um, because I was on my learner's permit, if I was responsible for the accident, I wouldn't get my license until I was 18 years old. So when the statey came up and said, what happened here? My stepfather immediately stepped forward and said, I just lost control of my car. Um, we went up the hill and came down. We're fine. We're just waiting for a tow truck. He, without even thinking, he took the blame for me. He took responsibility for me. I was beloved of him. I, my, my stepfather loved me all the time, but in that moment, he demonstrated his love for me by taking my blame. When Jesus came up out of the water, he was reminded of God's love for him. 
And given what happened next, you know, the sky rupturing and the pigeon and we're off into the desert to be tortured by Satan, it might be hard for us to objectively sit back and say, how is that (laughs) an expression of love? But the angels took care of him. And God was with him throughout the entire ordeal. And inspired by that love and guided by the Spirit, Jesus is with us the entire time. And Jesus, like my stepfather, intercedes for us all the time, no matter what. Born out of God's incredible grace and unconquerable love. Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus takes the blame for us. Jesus laid himself out for us. Because we, like him, are beloved of God. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this incredible love that never, ever gives up on us. We ask that you inspire us with that love to share it with others so that in your name we never, ever give up on each other. We ask that you give us the courage to walk the path and you give us the wisdom to obey the call of the Spirit when it teaches us over and over again how to live in righteousness with you and with each other in Jesus' name. Amen.
Do we have prayer requests to share this morning? I know I, I, I'd like for us to hold Delight's mother in prayer as she has entered into hospice care. We just ask God to give her comfort and remind her that his, God's unconquerable love is with her always and God's grace surrounds her. We ask for comfort for you and all of your family as well in this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Anyone else? I also would like to... Um, Go ahead, Ron. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> keep the uh, family of uh, the Edney family, Dennis Edney. He transitioned um, Tuesday. He was a good friend of my family. He was a musician, played all of the, all of the church services. And every time you called him, he was there. He was just a, a, a bright light, and he will truly be missed. So just Edney family is what I'm asking. We ask for God's comfort to be with them in their mourning and hold him, God, hold him in his grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What else? Let's pray together. Almighty God, on this first Sunday of Lent, we remember that your spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness where he experienced torment. We live in a world that sometimes gives us fear. We're afraid of our own torment. We're afraid of losing jobs or finances, relationships. We are afraid of so much. But in this Sunday, we also remember that even in the midst of his torment, Jesus heard your voice reminding him that he is your beloved and you are pleased with him. Let us also hear that good news once again today. Remind us that we are your beloved and that you are well pleased with us. Let those words echo in our hearts and give us the courage we need to face the world unafraid. Strengthen us and our world. Heal us. Heal our hearts and heal our hurting world, we pray. Embolden us to your work and share with us once again the good news of our salvation and your unrelenting love. In the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to be led and guided by the Spirit to show love and grace for others. Let us now bring our gifts to the offering, to the altar. The ushers will wait upon you for your offering. join in the offering prayer gracious God even in our brokenness you sustain us and angels wait upon us send us into the world strengthened by your word and trusting in your love to do your will for the sake of the healing of the world in the name and the spirit of Christ amen God is never going to force us to do anything. God doesn't work us that way. We're not chess pieces on a chessboard waiting for the next divine move to push us to the square we're supposed to be in. But God does let the Spirit help to move us in the right direction if we're open to it. 
And sometimes the direction the Spirit wants us to move in isn't comfortable. Sometimes it's frightening. <clears throat> sometimes it feels like you're stepping into hopelessness. But every step of the way, God is with us. Every step of the way, the Spirit lifts us. Every step of the way, Christ is at our side. Because we are beloved of God. And we make God happy, just as we are. And if we carry that knowledge in our hearts, there is literally nothing that we can't accomplish to build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and abide with you forevermore. And all of God's children say amen. amen. Let's sing together. I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain, Lord. I've just come from the fountain. His name's so sweet. I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain, Lord. I've just come from the fountain. His name's so sweet. Jesus, yes, yes, I do love my Jesus. Brother, do you love Jesus? His name so sweet. Oh Lord, I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain. Lord, I've just come from the fountain. His name so sweet. Oh, sister, do you love Jesus? Yes, yes, I do love my Jesus. Sister, do you love Jesus? His name's so sweet. Oh, Lord, I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain, Lord. I've just come from the fountain. His name's so sweet. Take it away, Dave. Oh, Lord, I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain, Lord. I've just come from the fountain. His name's so sweet. Oh, sinner, do you love Jesus? Yes, yes, I do love my Jesus. Sinner, do you love Jesus? His name's so sweet. Oh, Lord, I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain, Lord. I've just come from the fountain, his name so sweet. Oh Lord, I've just come from the fountain. I've just come from the fountain, Lord. I've just come from the fountain, his name so sweet.